Producing good evidence counts, and it should count for better decisions, better policy decisions. I think we would probably all agree with that here. I think the second pathway is more of a critical reflection, where we had a meeting a few years ago, this coming year in New York, with Rockefeller and several others from CDI. And they were reflecting on this, this trajectory over five, ten years, and thinking it's become very introverted. It seems to be evaluators talking to evaluators, um, I know there's many researchers here who are part of that debate. And it seems to be about just talking about methodology, and although it's very good and rigor is very important, it seems to be very introverted. And so we were reflecting on actually what do evaluators particularly, but what do researchers and analysts have to say about the world around us? And how can evaluators be less introverts and more about transformation? And particularly thinking about the challenges of our time, the big ones of inequality insecurity, migration, climate change, and sustainable development. So thinking through actually where are values in that space? What are they talking about? Why is there so much events and literature handed over to methodology and not enough to actually changing the world? So at CDI we spent some time the last few years thinking about how we can contribute to that. And we've been having debates about ethics and values in development and values in evaluation thinking through actually non-aid transfers, the vast resources that are transferred outside aid, and where does evidence evaluation play in those fields where the private sector is very strong, but evidence and accountability, particularly for the public, is perhaps less strong. So we've been trying to think through that. That kind of leads to today, really, our third pathway, that's more recent, and thinking through the policy space in which we operate in, that's become Seemingly, and we can debate whether it's true or not, very polarised. So, internationalism seems to be under threat from some quarters, a retreat to national agendas, and obviously Brexit and the election of President Trump seem most significant of that. But I think also a wider distrust of international development, a distrust of the status quo, a somewhat distrust of experts and expertise, and maybe a distrust of evidence in policy circles, with polarised views in the media and in policy debates in some quarters. I know that's a caricature, but that sense in which maybe things seem under threat, seem, things seem uncertain. And so it's these three strands really which come together. One is actually evidence is important and policy for policy, so evidence and foreign policy is important, the first one. The second one to be more transformative and less inversive in the way we operate in the world. But the third one, which is where we wanted to focus a lot today, is really about how do we operate in a world where there seems to be distrust of experts and expertise of evidence, where there seems to be um, a distrust of the state's power and those in power. And so how should we respond? How should we respond as evaluators, researchers, and analysts? Well, I think leaving you with this kind of last question, how could we respond 
that we could use evidence to help those most marginalised, those most marginalised by those processes of politics and globalisation. What role do we have as experts and people with, with supposedly a status and with evidence? What role do we have for those most disenfranchised by the current situation? So it's a great pleasure that we have today's event. I'm really pleased to have um, great panel speakers. I'm going to hand over to Lisa, who's going to take us through, introduce the panelists, and, and lead us through today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. So um, we've got now until 5.30 to have a debate, and I hope it will be a really engaged, exciting debate and that you'll all take part in it. We're going to start with three panellists, and I'll introduce them in a moment. They will each speak for 10 minutes. Um, we won't take any questions after they've spoken, and I hope they'll be provocative and give us things to think about. So keep a note of what you'd like to ask or how you'd like to respond. And at the end of those three, minute talks, then we will open up to questions and answers from the audience. We'll take from the set of comments and then come back to the panel and then the next set and then we'll continue from there. So we're really lucky. We've got a fantastic panel this afternoon. Um, on my right and going first we have Michael Anderson. So Michael is a visiting fellow at the Centre for Global Development. Um, he's also a member of our board of trustees here at IBS. Prior to this, he was um, CEO of the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, and he's also been a Director General at Lifford. So, um, really well qualified, I think, um, to speak about these issues today. Then we'll move to Owen Bader, um, who is a Vice President and Director for Europe for the Centre for Global Development. He's also a visiting professor in practice at the London School of Economics. He's also a former civil servant um, who worked at Number 10 and the HM Treasury as well as at Diffus. And then we will hear from Claire Mellonet on my left here, who is currently the Executive Director of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. So a big involvement there in question about evidence and data, which is headquartered in Washington DC, although she herself is based in London, um, where she was previously a managing director at ODI at the OC Development Institute. She also has a background working for a number of international NGOs and for the UN, and she's taught at the University of London and at the OU. So a mixture of roles here from within and outside government, in academia, in policy and in practice. And I think we'll get a range of perspectives on this question about how do we respond to a world that appears often to be anti-expert, anti-truth, and how particularly to answer Chris's question, do we support those who are most disenfranchised or marginalised by this kind of social affairs? So Michael, to kick us off, um, what do you have Thank to you. say to us on these issues? So, Melissa, I'm a believer that accountability should shape behaviour, so when I go over time, you start making noises. I'll let you know two minutes, <laughs> two minutes before the end. Great, right, thank you. Um, Thank you very much for sharing your time today. This is a really interesting topic that I'm passionate about. I hope we're going to have a good debate. I'm going to depart from the proposition, which I think probably most of us in the room will share, which is that if you're really interested in international development, you should care about learning. You should care about learning what's worked, what's failed, and what would we do differently next time. And here in, at uh, IDS, we care especially about how do we involve communities and people in helping to shape those understandings and not just simply having it done by experts? Um, I think we have a very, very important history here about how to do that in learning from. Now, as Chris said, this is a fantastic time for evaluation of evidence and learning in international development. Evaluation literacy is at an all-time high among politicians, journalists, philanthropists, business executives, and policymakers. And we've seen in some areas, including medicine and education, that this extends to consumers as well. And methodologically, we've never been in a place which is quite so rich as it is now. We are in a place where we've seen the growth in both evaluation and evidence-based policy. Um, there's been a renaissance in ethnographic methods. And I speak, I'm a former social anthropologist, so I care about how much we do with ethnography but a growing appetite for adaptive iteration, complexity theory, innovative methods to evaluate policy processes, and my particular favorite, favorite using experimental and quasi-experimental techniques to test propositions. So all that's, 
Oh, that's really good news. Um, we are, I feel, in the midst of what I have called in the past an evaluation revolution, an evidence revolution, where things are fundamentally changing. And although sometimes it feels like everything is terrible, I think that the underlying secular trend is very strong in terms of getting better quality evidence and uh, into policy making. So if that's the case, why does it feel so often, for those of us who are practitioners, why does it feel that evidence and balanced evaluations are not being heard? Why does it feel like we're not breaking through to policymakers? Why does it feel like we're not breaking through to the press and to public discourse? So I'm going to offer three, three reasons. Um, first, publication bias, which I'll be speaking about very quickly. Second, I think much more importantly, publicity bias. And third, what I'm going to call policy by slogan. My proposition this evening is that people who are practitioners in this area should not just sit by quietly and watch these things happen to us, but it's time for us to seize control of our own history and start to shape the environment in which we are in. But that means behaving rather differently from the way we have in the past. Let me talk about those three tendencies. First, publication bias. And this is well described. I'm not going to talk about it too extensively. But we know that in the academic world, publication bias occurs when the outcome of a, of a study or an experiment or the research, the outcome influences the decision whether to publish that outcome or not, which is nuts, right? That, that should not happen. So typically, academic journals are less likely to publish an article or to delay publication of an article um, if the treatment is shown to have no effect. And at worst, publication bias means that the results of published studies are systematically different from the results of unpublished studies. And since only about half of studies are actually published in the end, that is potentially a big problem. So what we're seeing in published journals is not an accurate reflection of the full body of research that's there. So this is a well-described problem. Some action is being taken. There's the All Trials campaign, for those of you who are followers of Ben Goldacre. Uh, earlier this year, the World Health Organization issued a joint statement on public disclosure of results from clinical trials. So in the medical field, there's a lot of work trying to register trials up front so we know which trials are being done, which research is being done, and we can be held accountable for, for what is published. But the medical world is way ahead of the rest of us. Um, and in space and international development, we have a lot to do to make sure that we're not succumbing to publication bias. That's partly within our gift. And I would argue later on that we can do something to shape that. The second trend I want to mention, <clears throat> actually this, uh, this is cheating, Melissa. It's actually two trends in one, portmanteau, um, <clears throat> is what I'm going to call publicity bias. And the first version of this, of publicity bias, is what I call everything is beautiful. So in the world of policy making, publication bias takes on this publicity. <laughs> if you look at uh, official websites of organizations, or the speeches of leaders, or the ministers or CEOs, or if you look at the official propaganda of organizations in the glossy literature, whether it's a government department or a business or a charity or a social campaign, what you find is there's all this fantastic impact happening. Huge problems out there, wonderful stories of things that are changing, everything is great. And if you look at these websites and literature and speeches, nothing ever goes wrong which is wonderful. I, it's highly unusual for most human endeavors that you can achieve such impact. Um, but that is the proposition that we tend to be offered in the official publications of most of these. And if I, I challenge you to scour the web pages of the world leading development charities, say Children, Oxfam, Care, Action Aid, Christian Aid. I haven't done a completely thorough search, so I've not met the right methodological standard, but I did spend last night looking at all of them. And I couldn't find, apart from a couple of very small exceptions, I couldn't find examples of people talking about what has failed. Um, it's just it's not what's out there. Now why, why don't they do that? Why don't governments and charities publish failures regularly? Because obviously politicians and CEOs don't want the negative publicity because officials are afraid of being punished. They're afraid that the tabloids are going to pick up the negative stories and exaggerate them, all kinds of reasons. But at the moment, the incentive framework is wrong for generating publicity about lessons learned. And that's something we can do something about. The second version, so I talked about publication bias and publicity bias, everything is beautiful version. My second part of publicity bias is the sky is falling version. 
And this is the version that we see in the tabloids and among certain politicians. We saw it, for example, at the end of 2016 when three of the UK's newspapers, the Times and the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail, ran a series of daily stories, day after day after day, criticizing the UK aid program. And they all ran editorials demanding that the aid budget be reduced. Now, the size of the aid budget is totally a legitimate topic for debate, completely endorsed that, and we want to have that informed debate. I'd be first to say that many aid programs have been based on poor design or implemented badly, or, and wherever there are instances of corruption or fraud should be stopped. But these articles weren't about that kind of debate. These were articles that were patently representing the facts, deliberately distorting costs and evaluations, and featured headlines that were plainly intended to trigger political outrage rather than a thoughtful critique. Now, the political economy of these newspapers makes sense. If I to sell newspapers, this is the way to sell newspapers but it's not a good example of promoting a uh, good debate. I don't have time to go into it, but we saw a terrific example in January of 20, 2017, this year, the Independent Commission for Aid Impact published a review of DFID's programs on direct cash transfers. And they concluded, as some of you have seen, that direct cash transfers provide value for taxpayers' money. The report was not universally glowing, but evaluation reports are never universally glowing. It's just an ironclad rule. If you're an evaluator, you've got to find a problem somewhere, and there's always something to find, right? So IHI inevitably has things that can be picked up that are criticisms. So the newspapers picked this up, and they quoted things out of context, and they portrayed um, they portrayed the cash transfer program as a one billion uh, pound goal. So that, they, oh, you brought it. <laughs> <laughs> so third, as I have two minutes, I'm going to talk briefly about policy made by slogan. I just want to give you one example, which is in 1983, Michael Howard, who's then Home Secretary in this country, um, came up with a slogan, the prison works. And he said, studies have shown that people who are thinking about prison are deterred from committing crime because they don't want to go to prison. A long story, and I can talk about it more, but the evidence is, does not support that. And we have some really good studies about what actually happens in cohorts of people. Um, and we, we know that actually prison doesn't work in that way. It has to do with the kinds of decision-making processes people are engaged in before they commit activities which are criminal. But Michael Howard, used that phrase, prison work, and it landed with his own party, it landed with the public. Theresa May used it again in 2010 when she became Home Secretary. And the point about this is that that kind of slogan, prison works, has intuitive appeal. It aligns with the views people have of human nature. And we have people and policymakers trusting the slogan, which seems right, rather than the the statistician, the sociologist, who tries to show the complex data that their intuition is wrong. And there's a communication gap we can talk about there. What do we do about this? So I, in a previous life, I used to work in the legal world. And lawyers were very, in my experience, were very focused on the particular cases they were engaged in. You may have views on that. But as a profession, we cared a lot about the rule of law as a systemic outcome that we were all interested in. And my proposition to you is, as development experts and evaluators, we have a strong interest in making sure that balanced assessments of what's worked and what's failed get into the public domain. And I think we have some ability to control that. But we need, it means that we would have to organize ourselves more as a movement and to take political action to shape the outcomes of that, rather than simply plowing our own firm of doing our own evaluations. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we'll turn to Owen. Thank Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Michael. Thanks to you all for coming on a, on a dark afternoon to talk about the important subject. Thanks. Thanks to you all for organizing this. Um, so Michael's made my job a bit easier because I agree with all of that. Um, when we first talked about what we were going to say to make sure we didn't repeat each other too much, uh, Michael sounded a little bit more negative, a bit more Eeyore-ish um, <laughs> than, uh, than he did just now. He's, I think he's turned into Owl, um, 
the wisdom. I'm going to try and be a bit more tiggerish. I think uh, actually the world is rather better than Michael described, although I agree with his, uh, with his um, biases that we need to progress. So I want to talk about three things, because that's what you have to do in discussions. Uh, I'm going to talk about swans, cyclones, and singers. Um, so swans first, you've, you've heard, all of you, I'm sure, that cliché about organisations or individuals floating serenely across the surface and underneath there's a lot of paddling that nobody sees. It's, a, it's familiar to people, one of the things that annoys me about the British establishment is that we place too much value on uh, appearing to do things effortlessly. And most things worth doing involve actually quite a lot of effort and uh, we should celebrate that. I actually think our political system, our government, here in the UK and in other governments that I've worked with, are like an upside down swan. <laughs> so there's a lot of paddling on the surface, a lot of flying around, most of it unconnected to any kind of locomotion. <laughs> Underneath, it's much more serene, sensible, long term, strategic. Within governments, there are civil servants working with people like you, academics, researchers, policy people, uh, thinking about the evidence, thinking about what works, working out what advice they're going to give to ministers, finding the opportunities in among the flapping to put that advice into the conversation. And I think it's a mistake for us to get too mesmerized by the flapping above the surface and forget that underneath that is a system that works pretty well. Um, People who, who gather information, gather evidence, use that to synthesize ideas and advice and, and, and surface that uh, and help drive policy. So it's an upside down swap. Um, uh, but I think that, uh, and I think it, it doesn't work perfectly, not come to that, but I think on the whole, that system works better than you sometimes get the impression of your, if you get your political information from Twitter. Uh, the second thing is about cyclones. We've all learned, and so I hope we've all learned, not to say that a particular cyclone, a particular extreme weather event, has been caused by climate change. Right? What we've all learned to say is that climate change increases the probability of these events, but we can't say whether any particular hurricane or cyclone has been caused by climate change because those things happen, used to happen anyway or continue to happen. What's happened is their frequency increases. I think that is the relationship between evidence and policy in the same way. What we can't do ever is say that a particular study or a particular data point or a particular piece of evidence has caused a particular decision to do something and to stop doing things. I think what we can say is that as we gather evidence, as we accumulate it in this, uh, this upside down swan moving through the water, that, that what we're doing is we're changing the probability of change. We're changing the likelihood of good decisions being made. Certainly my experience in, uh, in White Wall is that ministers want to know that they're on the side of doing the right thing, partly because most of them come into politics uh, with some belief that uh, in public service, but also because they don't want to look stupid later on. So they will ask the question, you know, what does the evidence tell us? And when I was in number 10, um, I vividly remember Alistair Campbell, you know, the first question he wanted to know is, what, what's the evidence on this? And if you were asking him to announce something or defend something, and you said, we just don't know, we have no evidence on this, I'm not fucking defending that then. <laughs> yeah. So governments will actually make judgments on the evidence, although it's very hard to connect any particular piece of evidence to any particular decision. That doesn't mean that evidence doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Just as we know that climate change increases the frequency of the extreme weather events. So that's my second thing, cyclones. My third, uh, my, my third point is about singers. I, um, I, I brought along with these Daily Mail, I will, I'll, I'll, come to the, I'll come to the Daily Mail in a second, but um, this is my, a couple of bits of anecdote rather than evidence. <coughs> that decisions in development really are being evidence good. And I guess you can't all see that, so I'm actually going to use this slide. Uh, so since 1990, roughly, when I started uh, thinking of working uh, in various ways in development, ODA has doubled, that's the dotted line, 
In that time, health odour has roughly quadrupled, and education odour has increased by about 50%. Okay, so um, uh, odour being um, overseas development assistance or foreign aid, for those of you who don't know the acronym. So what we're seeing is a much bigger, much uh, more sustained increase in health spending in foreign aid and in education spending in foreign aid. And there are lots of possible explanations for that. One possible explanation, uh, which relates to something that Michael said about how much further advanced the medical profession is in things like dealing with publication bias, is that in health they have a much um, a stronger culture of gathering rigorous evidence, the efficacy of interventions, than the education sector. And I think this reflects a repeated set of decisions by ministers that they want to do things that they can defend with evidence. Um, I have sat in many conversations about, you know, should we give money to Gavi? And everybody says, yes, you can't go wrong with spending money on vaccines, right? Because you couldn't prove that this stuff works. Now, I feel very mixed about that, right? Because there are lots of really important worldwide interventions which are much harder to demonstrate impact for than vaccines. Now, vaccines is the, easy, is the the easy case. And I think it would be a great mistake if we stopped spending money on some things that are hard to demonstrate impact for, which could be very important in transformation. Education is not one of those things. Education, actually, you can demonstrate with experimental and quasi-experimental methods and a whole range of other methods. You could run proper, rigorous impact evaluations of education interventions. And the education community just hasn't done it. And I think that's why the education, why we, we have this continued worry about why education spending is not rising fast enough. Now, I think that's a real problem for the education community and I don't feel very comfortable either about the fact that there are kids across the developing world who are not getting an education or not getting as good an education as they should because the education community hasn't done their job properly in impact evaluation. But, but I, think it, okay, great. I think it goes to the, um, uh, the question of are we using evidence? I think the answer is that where there is evidence, we're using it, and that is driving it. I'm going to give you a shorter term, a shorter term example in my last two minutes, which is the Daily Mail. So Michael mentioned, this is January the 3rd, this Daily Mail, uh, it's this one. Cue here for UK's billion pound foreign aid cash point. I love the Daily Mail. Uh, about a week earlier, they have published this one. Britain gives five million pounds to an African girl band. That's the singers in my Okay. Now, what happened to these two things that came out within, you know, a couple of weeks of each other? This one, Britain gives five million to an African girl band. That was cut. That program was abolished. The foreign aid one, the, the sorry, the, um, uh, the Pakistan cash transfers one was not abolished. In fact, a Downing Street spokesman, not a different spokesman, a Downing Street spokesperson said, we think this is a respected system for getting aid to those who need it most. We would only pursue such an option where we were clear that results have been achieved and verified. So, big Daily Mail front page attack. One of them is abolished after the attack. One of them persists after the attack. And the one that persists after the attack is the one for which there are randomized controlled trials demonstrating its efficacy. In fact, there was a uh, Cochrane evaluation published last week about cash transfers, putting some of this data together. The gold band one, I had begged the people running that to do a proper rigorous evaluation. I suspect it was quite a good program, actually. But they didn't do a rigorous impact evaluation. And when the Daily Mail called it out, they had nothing to show to demonstrate that it worked. And they pulled it back. So I think evidence does matter. I think it is influencing policy. Not as direct as some of, some of us might want, but I think it's real, and I think that all of my suggestions for how to do this better <coughs> are valid, but don't walk away from this thinking that policymakers aren't taking account of the evidence because they are. Thanks very much.
Okay, so we've had Tigger, and I love the for the outside of this one. So, Claire, over to you. Right, I don't think I come prepared with a Winnie the Pooh character. <laughs> so I'm sorry to uh, I'm sorry to disappoint. I I wanted to sort of broaden us out a little bit and think and just answer the, the kind of broader question about post truth and evidence and experts that that was raised at the beginning. Um, I also, despite my best efforts, have three points, so let's uh, see if I can either expand or contract them and show a little bit of variety here. Um, I mean, my first is I think, you know, we have to keep a certain sense of perspective on this. This kind of, this narrative of post-truth suggests that there was once some golden age of truth that we are all tragically moving away from. I think that's not true in lots of ways. <laughs> I mean, first of all, probably on balance, the things that people think are true are truer now than on average than they ever have been. You know, if you think that what people thought a hundred years ago, women were inferior to men, colonialism was a great thing, uh, you know, all sorts of things that people thought about science, about medicine, about the way the world works, which you know, I think we would think that the things we think about those things now are much truer. So I think on balance, this idea that somehow we're moving from a golden age of truth to a sort of period where suddenly no one believes anything anymore, and if they do, it's probably wrong, is something that we should question. It's a sort of nice narrative of doom and gloom, and it fits a lot about feelings about the world and Brexit and Trump and so on and so on, but I kind of question it. The second one, which is linked and kind of the opposite of that, of course, is that people have always died. You know, the dark arts of propaganda were not born with Donald Trump. And politicians have always died, propaganda has always been there, people have always used and abused, you know, often abused the truth in all kinds of ways to try to influence what people think, to get people to do, to do or not do things, get people to follow political movements and so on. Again, that's not new, it's ancient, it's as old as governments. Um, and the third thing, and this relates to, to what you said in the introduction, is I think it, it's kind of odd, and I don't know if it's a generational thing, or, you know, we all feel terribly, so that this is terrible, people don't believe in experts anymore, they're questioning the status quo, they're questioning the establishment. You know, many of us in an earlier life probably would have considered questioning the establishment to be a jolly good thing. <laughs> And I think we certainly don't in any sense want people to stop questioning the establishment. That's how change happens. And just because something is the status quo does not mean it's necessarily right. I think what we're alarmed about now is that the people who seem to be having most airtime in their questioning of the status quo are not people who we, and I'm using we in the sense of a sort of liberal um, establishment here feel very comfortable with. But there are previous periods when everyone's been questioning the establishment where people all endorsed this wholeheartedly and thought this was absolutely fantastic and great. Some of the some of the most important changes that we've seen in society have resulted from that. So I think just because we're questioning the establishment, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> the thing is what are the questions that people are asking? Who and what actions do they want people to take as a result? So I think first of all as we're thinking about this narrative of post-truth and feeling very doom and gloom about it, we should take a minute to have a sort of sense of perspective and see whether the extent to which these, this sort of inference that we're making about broad trends in society is actually driven by even a few individuals and a few things that are happening in specific countries that we quite rightly feel very uncomfortable about, but that doesn't necessarily make it a trend, and if it is a trend, it doesn't actually necessarily make it a bad trend. The second point is, I think, to sort of speak slightly against myself, I do think that something has changed. And I think what's changed is not the way people think, it's not the lying, it's not the propaganda, it's not the establishment or pro-establishment, but I think what's changed is the infrastructure for lying has completely changed. And that's what we're seeing. And I think we have a lying at a scale and at a speed which is, is new and we're not responding to that very well and we kind of don't really know what to make of it. I think, you know, that with Facebook, with Twitter, with the new technologies, 
I mean, we've seen, you know, one way to think of this is almost as a sort of economic change. What we've seen is, you know, you can think about it, and I think I'm certainly, in fact, I know I'm not the first to say this, as analogous to the, to the invention of the printing press. And that when the printing press was invented, churches, the Catholic Church, lost its monopoly on the dissemination of information. With Twitter, with Facebook, newspapers by and large, and big news conglomerates have lost their monopoly on the dissemination of information. And we don't, we haven't responded well to that, I think it's safe to say. We don't really know what to make of that world. You know, arguably the invention of the printing press led to the collapse, you know, led to the Reformation, just seen the 500 year anniversary of that this year. Um, I don't think we have no idea what's going to result from this particular breaking of this particular monopoly and all the things that have, that have um, resulted from it. But I think that is a way to look at this, which gives us some clues about some of the causes of action to take. You know, we're seeing it's led to leading to a social change, leading to an economic change. It's become an economic opportunity. You can pay teenagers in Macedonia to churn out uh, to churn out information because it's worth it. You can involve, you can monetize the production of propaganda in a way that was never possible before and has been possible through this technological change. And I think again, that's an, you know, that's an, a change to our, to a sort of economic structure of the production and dissemination of news and we need to think about what to do about that. What, as Michael said, what are the legal frameworks that we want here? What are the economic frameworks that we want here? How do we respond to that in terms of the, the business models of those organisations who perhaps do trust? You know, I think we're seeing very different kinds of business models emerging in the businesses of the production dissemination of information. Some are more successful than others. <coughs> the ones that are less successful, for all of our sakes, need to find some better way to do it. Because we certainly don't want you know, the, all of the, the, sort of the BBC to go bust and everyone to get all of their news from Facebook. So I think this is a problem, this is a question of regulation, it's a question of, of business models, it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of practical question. I don't really think this whole question of post-truth is, is an existential point in the way that sometimes it's posed. I actually think it's quite a practical problem that we have no idea how to solve and we have no idea where this is ending. Um, but I think that gives us you know, it's, it gives us, I think, a better way to think about it. Governments desperately need to catch up with this. You know, we're, governments are so far behind on the, in thinking about the regulation and the legal frameworks and all of the other architecture that they want to put in place to, to, to control this and to try to get the outcomes that actually would take society into a better place. So I don't think we've even come close to knowing how we want this to be. And I think, um, sure, okay. So it, I think there's a sort of regulatory framework. I think there's also a social norms framework here. We don't even know what we actually think about this. Is it good or bad? You know, I think, you know, sometimes legislation and legal frameworks can lead social norms, sometimes they follow. I just think there's a big thing has happened here, and we don't know what it is, but I think we have to see it for what it is, to be able and understand the nature of the thing which has changed, to be able to tackle it. And I think it's not the thing we think of, I think it's, a, it's an infrastructure and economic change. But my third thing, I think, is, take, brings us back more to the terrain of evaluation. And I think it's not just the, the Facebook and Twitter that have, that have that are driving what people think, or at least that are creating an environment where people are receptive to this sort of post-truth method. I do think that in the world of evidence and the kind of data that we use to describe the state of the world, to evaluate the state of the world, to make policy about the state of the world, we do need to think about whether this is actually reflecting the world as people see it. You know, data is not a thing. You know, one can measure an outcome, a health outcome, to use ozone in lots of different ways. You can measure it in terms of lives lived, you can measure it in terms of freedom from pain, you can measure it in terms of whether the nurse was nice to you at the hospital. All of these things are outcomes in, and reflect the way that people think about healthcare. And we choose some rather than others to reflect, to be the proxy, if you like, for health in general and for how people think. 
And in order for people to trust that data, we need to choose proxies which kind of chime with the things that they think are important about their own lives. Otherwise, they don't see themselves in the data and they start to mistrust the whole enterprise. One tiny example, my son, who's 13, is at secondary school. It started out as a fairly, uh, a few years ago, it went through a bit of a crisis. The exam results did terribly. This year, the GCSE results were great. I'm a governor of the school. Everyone's feeling incredibly happy. It feels like suddenly it's a great school and everything's fine. And I said to my son, no, do you feel better now you're kind of in a school? The exam was like, oh, it doesn't make a difference to me. You know, why should I care? I'm in year nine. You know, what I care about is, is there a sandwich that I want when I come down to the cafeteria at lunchtime? You know, is it, have I got friends to play with? Da, da, da. Those are his indicators. So the data on exam results, which we're using to measure the quality of the school, is not reflecting that. And if he's told, this makes you a good school, it's like, well, I don't need the data. Because it's not reflecting my experience. And I think we see that again and again in data. You know, we're told there's full employment. Great, great. We're also told that you know, there's a large part of the working age population that claiming universal credit and waiting for months and months for it. So you can't expect people to feel great about the fact they've got a job if they have to not if they have a job, maybe two jobs, and also claim benefit. That's not the using a headline employment figure to tell people that the economy is working okay is just they're not going to believe it because it doesn't reflect their experience, it doesn't reflect what they think is important. So I think if we want people to believe in evidence. And if we want to use evaluations in ways that are actually helping to understand whether we're producing the outcomes that people want and that people believe are making their lives better, we have to take a little time to think, dig a little bit deeper into is the evidence that we see, we think of as the evidence that truly reflects the state of the world, is that actually how people themselves, the people who we're talking to, who we want to believe this stuff, who we think are being corrupted by post-truth and all sorts of, you know, the, the spectres of the Daily Mail. Do they, are we actually using the numbers that tell the story as they see it and reflect what they think is important? Because if not, I don't entirely blame them for not always believing us. Thank you.
findings um, yet. Whatever it is, I think what may have shifted is the accountability relationship. And in parts of Africa and Eastern Europe, where we're now working at IDS, I'm sorry, I forgot to say I'm a fellow at IDS, um, we, we find that the trajectory is slightly in the other direction, which is um, policy actors and academics are more interested in making that linkage with each other. Um, and wanting more evidence from each other and wanting to have those conversations than might exist here right now where we think it's just shifting back. In Africa, I think it's shifting in the direction of evidence and we're respecting that a little more. Right. Um, so I think there was a question in the front here. So, yeah, if you could please say who you are. Hi, I'm Emmy from ITAP and I'm keeping an eye on the Facebook questions. So I have a Facebook question from... Zhu Yu Li, and he asks, who gets to find what evidence is? Okay. I'm going to come back to the panel in a moment, then I'm going to take a couple more things. So, okay, so over here in the second row. Uh, hi, my name is Naeem. I work for a development consultancy company called TI, and I'm currently working in Ethiopia mm -hmm. for our private sector. So, what I wanted to talk about is, is the capacity of evaluation techniques, methodologies of the national governments that we work in different countries. And the reason I say that from two points of view. Firstly, because we are working with those national governments in the end, and for achieving any systemic change, long-term long -term goal of any particular development, <coughs> it's very important that the national governments have to realize and understand how those initiatives are being evaluated and they can make their own call as well, that it is working for them or not, because we can impose and they can succumb to many things unless they really realize by themselves it is useful for them or not. Uh, secondly, in terms of managing narrative, this is also important, because we live in a global world, so trade deals like AGWA or, or uh, deal with Abrams, the European one, if there is a narrative which says that these are not really working for the European countries or even for the developing countries, we need to have a situation where the national government actually make an argument that no, this is working or not. And currently research around that A is missing and B, even if it is there, it's not from the point of view of the national government because they are not in a position to do this sort of thing. So it's really important that we bring that aspect of, of research and, and narrative from the national government. Okay, that's great. I'll take one more in this round, so just behind that. Um, Andre from uh, Ipsos. Uh, I'll try to make a little bit of a more concise question. Um, but um, we've, uh, we've we've been uh, from the policy and evaluation unit at Ipsos, and we've, um, we've we've been we've entered this post through there, and it's great to sort of hear about the changes that have uh, have come about. Uh, but we also have uh, more policy-based evaluation, um, and there's more evaluations that have been um, commissioned than ever before. So I would be interested to hear the panel's views on uh, whether the evidence that is being generated now in the post trip era is, has more weight, less weight, or the same weight as, uh, as if we went before we entered the post trip era. Okay, well, great set of questions from lots of angles. So I'm now going to go back to the panel in order and we can respond to them and then we'll a couple of other directions particular people that respond. Right. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to take all of them, uh, but if, if there's anything unaddressed at the end, I'm happy to come back. Mm -hmm. The one I'm going to grab is who gets to define what evidence is, mm -hmm. which I think is the central question. And mm -hmm. anyone who is a thinking person has to face that question, I think, a little with some discomfort. Uh, anybody who draws a bright line who says this is good evidence and that's bad evidence. <laughs> There's a high burden of proof to demonstrate that that is the case. That said, I think that we, we, are, we are able to draw distinctions, and there are people who are uh, professionals in this area learn to draw those distinctions. I think I would, I would, dis, I would disagree with, with Claire on one point, which I, I think there is one way in which we have a different attitude to facts. It's not unprecedented in human history, but it is particularly acute at the moment, which is out-and-out out disagreements about numbers and whether things happened or not seem to be go unchallenged 
a bit more, or if they're challenged, they, the effective challenge fails to stop politicians in their tracks. So, you know, the President Trump offering alternative facts on the number of people who attended the inauguration, I regard as a good example. Actually, there's really good photographic evidence. It's pretty straightforward. And, and you know, if, if you're living in a culture where you can take that pretty straightforward photographic evidence and show it to someone who's in power and they refuse to be held accountable by that, there's a lack of moral suasion there, which is breaking one of our fundamental rules. Um, and so, in terms of what is good evidence, I, I think there's, that is a place to start. I, I do think that you know, in what is good evidence for evaluation, we're not going to get to the bottom of that tonight. I think there's some, lots and lots of debates, uh, lots of gray areas. But I, I think it is a place where thoughtful people who are acting with the right kinds of motives for trying to get to better understandings can agree that in these circumstances, this kind of study works better, and in that kind of circumstances, this sort of study works better, and that we need to triangulate our information and listen and be humble and nevertheless bold in drawing conclusions. So I'm just going to stop on that one, Melissa, and hand this over. Right, so, okay. Okay. Well, so, okay. Yeah. okay. So um, <laughs> I mean, I think on the, on the accountability relationship, I think, I mean, I sort of echo Michael, really. I think facts have always been part of the accountability relationship between politicians and people. And I take your point about the inauguration numbers, the 350 million for the NHS is another example of that. I think, you know, perhaps we're seeing a sort of fraying in some specific cases, you know, in those two cases of, um, of facts as part of the currency of that accountability relationship between politicians and the people they govern. But I don't think facts were ever the whole or even the main sort of element, you know, ingredient in that recipe. I think far more it's about identification, it's about, you know, study after study shows that in fact it's, it's sort of feeling a sense of which group you belong to, um, a sense of whether people's sort of world view, charm doing, et cetera, et cetera, that are actually driving people's ethical, people's political decision making and therefore the implied accountability behind that choice. So I think, you know, it may be true at the margins. Um, I mean, I think Michael's answered the question about evidence. Um, I mean, two, also just the point about capacity, I think, is really important. Um, I mean, not strictly speaking on this point, but in the, the organisation that I run, um, the main thing that we do is work very closely with governments on sort of their data systems writ large. So we work with governments across the whole of across all the different departments in government mm -hmm. to look at their health data, their education data, their production of national statistics, and how those things are working together and what are the different types of data from other sources, from mobile phone data, from satellites or whatever that you can put in to improve that. And one of the things entirely unsurprisingly to anyone in this room is the astonishing lack of capacity which reflects, you know, the lack of, which reflects, and this is something we haven't yet talked about here, a lack of priority which is often given by governments in their <laughs> spending decisions around providing the resources that would give us the underpinning of facts and evidence for government policy making. So we work closely with the government of Kenya, for example, and we were, you know, we're just working with the Ministry of Agriculture in Kenya to get access to a whole load of data from satellites so they can track climate change and they can give farmers much more accurate weather data, all kinds of cool things. The hitch being that there's one statistician in the Ministry of Agriculture. That's it. So, you know, give them, the data can come raining down and actually there's going to need a whole lot of other things to happen before that's actually of any value. So I think capacity is, you know, is critical, but even before capacity comes the desire by governments to invest in that capacity always comes back to the politics in the end. So, uh, right, yeah, two uh, brief yeah, yeah. One, is, one is about capacity and one is about power. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on capacity, I, uh, I think it's interesting how poor an example that the international development the corporation community has set governments in investing in uh, not only statistical capacity, which, as the says, has been massively underinvested, but in requiring rigorous evidence 
for our own advice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there is no point in us telling governments that they ought to uh, be evidence-led and then give them some more decisions when we roam around the world with outdated, old-fashioned ideological uh, positions about all kinds of things and spend a lot of uh, taxpayers' money on it and get away with it because the places where we're spending that money are um, far away from the voters who hold our own government. Mm -hmm. so, if we're serious about building capacity and building commitment to evidence-based decision-making, then we need to build this into our own behaviour um, as step one uh, of, of that. Um, and we're just not building it, and we're not doing it on anything like this yet. Um, the point about power um, is, um, again, me being a bit more tiggerish than others. I think one of the things that is um, uh, that many of us feel is that uh, the establishment or the elite, or however you want to talk about it, feel as if that the, in some sense power and privilege for us to decide what the evidence is and what it means and what, what a fact is, is slipping away from us and it's being democratized. And on the whole, I think that's a good thing, uh, actually. And I think it's good that people feel empowered to challenge. And I think oftentimes when people have felt that our cherry-picking of evidence and quotes to say the economy is growing great or unemployment is really low, as Claire said, if people's real experience doesn't match the facts that we cite, it's not surprising that increasingly the public uh, are disbelieving of that and look for alternative uh, evidence. And um, I think this is partly chickens coming home to roost about the way governments have used evidence and data. Uh, and I think on the whole this is a correction. Now is that an unalloyed good uh, development? No. Um, we clearly need to find a way um, <coughs> to uh, enable that more democratic decision making about what the evidence is telling us, to, set, to settle to walk more towards truth and less towards um, what Russian bots are telling us on Twitter. Um, but I actually believe that the growth of social media and the, and the growth of education and communication will, over time, settle towards um, uh, people telling us what their, the truth is that they experience and that um, uh, organisations and individuals who are conveying evidence and facts that speak to people's real experiences will increasingly be believed and um, uh, people who don't <coughs> won't and I think oh, well, that's a good thing. So, um, power really matters for this, and I think it is, it's, a, um, uh, it's a change that many of us find difficult. Um, those of us who you know, have worked in Whitehall or are professors in universities. Um, but, I, but I think it's basically something we should welcome and figure out how to embrace rather than um, run scared from. Mm. I'm really glad that point has come up, actually, in relation to what Claire was, Claire was saying about the, the questioning of truth is not new. I mean, for many of us who've spent most of our lives questioning singular truths and arguing against a notion that there is one objective truth and saying that actually truth is contingent and it's constantly produced and reproduced through science and discovery and contestation, and actually we need a democratization of knowledge and development and to recognize the plurality of truths and then to have deliberative processes amongst them. Um, it's rather odd to find oneself sometimes, somehow having to defend truth. It's <laughs> very uncomfortable. Um, so, so I'm glad this has been opened up. The question of actually there are plural truths, and that's a good thing. The question then is the politics and power about who gets to manipulate and allow their version of the truth to hold. But let's take another round of, of questions and comments. So, again, yeah, okay, we've got one at the front here. Uh, bar from my hand. Um, I, I think that's a good debate, and I think about sort of the point of um, the experiential empirical view of um, unemployment and education in the UK is, is very valid, isn't it? But I think international development is different because most of the general public don't experience international development. They have to take their evidence by proxy, and whether it's the front page of the Daily Mail or whether it's Michael Burke in Ethiopia in the 80s. They, they have to take it by proxy. So what can they use to sort of to, to gather that evidence? And what can we do as evaluators to make that more objective? 
because the average valuation of Paul is a long way from being something that the public would have any enthusiasm from consuming. And Michael, you, you, you know, you, you've said that we have a responsibility to get public assessment into the public domain, and that, that isn't putting our valuation reports on our web pages because that's not going to drive traffic at all. So what, what do we do to, to engage it? We're, you know, we're, we're never going to win the front page of the front page of the mail debate because we're just not engaging in an actually visible way through through what we do. So in a way, we sit to help inform that debate, which at the moment is, is a debate by proxy and therefore becomes very emotional and, and is easily hijacked on both sides of the spectrum. Just ask who you are. Sorry, Sorry I'm Julian Barr from my side. Absolutely. Okay, great. So let's have another question through from our online audience. A question from Tamlin and Connell on democratising evidence. If people's experience becomes a prominent focus in evidence-based policy and evaluation, then do we run the risk of promoting certain experiences over others? How does the panel see this challenge being addressed? Good one. Okay, so we'll go just behind. Um, hi, thank you very much for this talk. It's a very, very stimulating conversation. My name is Marina Navarro, I am from Peru, and I am a first year PhD student at SPRU. Um, what I wanted to, to, to ask is in relation with the examples you gave about the importance of relying on evidence to, in order to design and implement better policies. When you talk about the UK, it makes perfect sense to me because you have uh, research councils, you have charities that are giving money for research that focus on the problems that the UK is facing. But what happens when we think about Latin American countries? For instance, uh, I, I, I think we have lost our independence in research matters for two reasons. First of all, uh, we, we see our, our research agenda constraint of who is funding the research. For example, if we, if we got funding from a U.S. country, from, from the U.S., for example, uh, the results of that research should be uh, aligned to the interests of the organization that is funding, on one hand. And on the other hand, what happens with the dominant literature that is constantly reinforcing imaginaries of um, uh, regional organizations like the Inter-American Development Bank that are like actually advising for policies that do not match our context problems. And that, that's what I wanted to raise. Great. Let's have a couple more in this round. So I'll um, come to you next. Um, yeah. Hello, I'm Hilton from uh, IDS in the Center for Development Income. Um, my question is, or my, my point is, that, uh, in the past, perhaps there was an a over um, in, in the past, interest groups were seen as the, the, the ones that define policies. Uh, the fact that evidence-based policy come up is, is, is a very short period in, in time that it is sort of, yeah, believed to be the basis of policy making. And perhaps it is in, in the UK, Northern Europe or something, but in the rest of the world, the interest groups are obviously the driving forces of policy decision making and not evidence. That's, uh, which is not a good point, but um, the, the trend to invest in evidence based policy and impact evaluations and cross experimental designs of interventions, because also the risk that it, um, and when, when interest groups are involved, at least it's obvious that there needs to be a settlement of the interests. Uh, so there needs to be a sense-making process about the data that's being uh, collected. Now with the quasi-experimental RCT, it, it, it appears a little bit that the evidence itself is the decision, and the sense-making is less necessary. And, and I think that bears the reason I've been quite involved also in those quasi-experimental designs. If you if you do them, you know that the evidence is not always that strong as that you think and you hope that it is when you start the research. But often it is taken as, as hard evidence and, and used uh, in policy making, while the sense making and uh, explicitly recognizing by different perspectives 
and, and that uh, selective harvesting evidence from the world that aligns with your interests is not necessarily bad. Could be also way forward. I think that's a really good point. And it's the difference that's sometimes talked about between evidence-based policy and evidence-backed policy, where actually it's then um, you hand over the food to the world of politics and things like that. I'm going to take one more, so they do here, and so then I'll come back to the panel so you can pick what you'd like to respond to. I'm just thinking about that. Um, hi, my name is Lucy Clark. Um, I'm the monitoring evaluation and learning manager at IBS as of two weeks. So, <laughs> uh, so this is a great, uh, great panel uh, to get to go. Um, I would just like to pick up on the point that Owen's that the examples that Owen used in terms of the health education, firstly, and just looking a little bit about unpicking the difference between kind of qualitative and quantitative, and that this kind of idea that the things that, what's that everything, not everything that we can measure counts, not everything that counts can be measured, and health interventions being a lot easier to measure than education. It's not that we can't do it, but it's, it, you know, the outputs and the outcomes are much more long term. The idea of kind of what are the proxies that you use to, to get engage those measurements to become much broader, um, less kind of focused on the program itself, so therefore more open to interpretation and therefore manipulation by the media. And I think the, the kind of the direct, the Daily Mail example of direct transfer versus the Ethiopian cop band, which I assume was some sort of like women's empowerment initiative, which you know is incredibly complex. And I've just come, you know, my journey to ideas is via uh, ActionAid and Oxfam, so I've been very much involved in trying to evaluate those sorts of Issues and it's it's you know it's it's so broad. There are so many different things to take into consideration. So this idea of you know what types of evidence, how do we create a space for the evidence of social change, behaviour change within this debate, um, to make sure that you know we're capturing these really important, but you know I I, I feel increasingly difficult to argue for um, issues in the international development space like empowerment and education as the space shrinks and we're more dependent on evidence, how do we argue for less tangible outcomes as important evidence too? Okay, great. Well, there's a whole set of questions there that are really about different sorts of evidence and their multiple relationships with, with policy and politics. So, I need you to respond as you like. I'm going to start with Michael. Can I go last? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, love it. Last, last time. So um, let me start with the one about um, what the, I assume you mean the taxpaying public and to the rich mm -hmm. come here, yes, mm -hmm. you know, what evidence they should, can and should rely on um, uh, in international development. Um, I, I've, as you probably know, I've been a long time campaigner for radical transparency in the aid program, uh, partly for this reason. Um, I think that, back to these, these questions of power and elites again, I think the development community has operated as an elite that wishes to act as a buffer between the, the taxpaying public, who are paying you know, something like four or five hundred pounds per year per household for our international aid program. That, that many of us um, believe that if you let those people have too much control, too much influence, too much say, too much, too much knowledge of our aid program, that they will throw it out because they're ignorant or racist or just not as knowledgeable as we philosopher kings. And so what we must do is tell them stories, ramp up our press game, tell, you know, tell anecdotes and produce brochures. But the last thing we must do is allow them to engage directly with what we're actually doing and where we're doing it, the choices we're making, the risks we're taking. And I think that's a colossal error. Actually, and I think it's, it's been unsustainable across all our other public services, uh, domestically in health and education and elsewhere. Where what we've what we've seen is, if you, is public engagement really matters for building support for these services. And I, I um, suspect it may now be too late to rectify it. I hope I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but I think we could do a much better job of being able to show people where their money is going and at least what outputs and activities it's financing and show them much more directly the quantitative and qualitative evidence 
including feedback from the intended beneficiaries themselves, about what that is achieving. And I think our failure to do that on a systematic basis, to try to filter all that through DFID and, and professional organizations who tell the story we want to tell, breeds distrust, and rightly so, in the people who are paying many of our salaries, not, not in fact my salary in any case. But, um, so I think, that, I think there's a huge agenda there to engage the public in what's going on. I think they, I, do I think they will all spend their evenings hunched over <laughs> their laptops looking to see where they're in? No. But, but some of them will, and the fact that they know that they could if they wanted to makes a huge difference to trust. People sense when they're being held at arm's length. And I think we're, we are in serious danger of suffering from the Ratner effect. Those of you who don't know who Jared Ratner was, the Googling afterwards. So, so I, I think there's a real challenge there. Um, on the, the other one I'm going to have a crack at, but feel free to disagree with me, is, is this question of um, uh, you know, education spending not going up as fast because it's harder to evaluate the health spending. Um, so two things about that. One is I just don't agree that education spending is that hard to evaluate. Um, you can do randomised control trials in education just as you can in health. The health community fought like mad when, when some among them said we ought to do these randomised control trials. Oh, no, it's impossible in our area. <coughs> so the, every expert thinks that proper evaluation of their activity is impossible and everything else is impossible. <laughs> Right? And it's, it's just not true. In, in the case of the um, uh, Girl Effect program, when they were planning it, I went to them and said, why didn't you randomize the rug out of this thing? Do it in different areas and, and get a control group and see what happens to the things you care about in these different areas. Uh, you know, is there more female participation at school? Is there more, does the concept of prevalence rate go up? Is there, are there fewer arms of pregnancies? You can measure these things. And they said, oh, no, no, we know it works. And, you know, we need to get on with it. And our backers want to know, that you, you bureaucrats, you and your ivory tower, what the hell do you know? Um, you know, we have to strike while the iron is hot, yada, yada, yada. Consequence, no evidence, um, other than assertion and branding. And when the Daily Mail came to them, they had nothing to rest on. And I think that was a colossal mistake. And, and I, I actually believe in that program. I, I think it was a good idea, probably well executed, and for very small amounts of money, it could have transformed a number of people's lives. And I think it's a, a tragedy that it wasn't properly evaluated. There are things that are hard to evaluate. Uh, certainly hard to evaluate the randomized control class, which is not the answer to it. You know, there are lots of other forms of evaluation than that. Um, uh, and there are lots of things that are hard to evaluate quantitatively. But actually, a lot of what we spend our money on can be evaluated rigorously and quantitatively, and should be. Um, and we should then defend the things that can't be evaluated um, uh, in other ways. But, but there is also a question that is going to cause consternation in this audience. If we don't know and can't show that it works, and we have an alternative that we do know and can show it works, how much should we be spending on it based on our hunch? Right? I mean, if there are things which, you know, in our bones we think are probably a good idea, but really can't be evaluated, but we can spend that same amount of money vaccinating kids against measles, at least part of me thinks we should vaccinate kids against measles. And that's unpopular with the people doing these other things. But, you know, I, we have, I think we do have a responsibility to the lives we can save, not to waste money on things and, and just wave our hands and say, oh, it's very difficult to evaluate, so let's just do it anyway. I think I mean, it would be good to have some questions and responses to that from those of you in the audience who work with mixed methods evaluation, for instance, who might want to take issue with the idea that if we can't measure it, we can't put it together. There are lots of other forms of evaluation, okay. including okay. non quantitative Okay, right. Well, that would be good to pick this up. So, Claire, would you like to pick up on. Yes, I mean, first of all, I agree with all of that very passionate polemic mm. from, uh, from Owen, um, absolutely. And I think, you know, for those of you who, who know her, Ruth Levine from the Hewlett Foundation has recently been writing some very passionate, uh, equally passionate stuff about the moral case for evaluation. Mm -hmm. And I think this is absolutely critical. And I think we have a moral case, as, as Owen was saying, to the people whose money we're spending. I also think we have a moral case to the people who are the kind of 
subjects of the intervention, to the people whose lives we say we are improving. Yeah. You know, I don't think it's okay to go in and kind of say to someone, hey, we're going to run this program and it's going to make everything great for you, without asking them whether they think, in fact, it is making things great for them, or whether actually maybe they prefer something else, or whether actually, you know, I think there's a moral case on both ends of the, of the relationship for evaluation. I mean, I feel equally strongly that this is absolutely imperative for the to do so, to have the, the kind of, I would never have the confidence to go in and go, well, I can't measure it. I don't know if you really want it. I don't know if you're actually going to be better afterwards, but I'll do it anyway. You know, it's not okay to do that. And I think we have to sort of stop giving ourselves that get out of jail free card. And I think partly because, and I, again, I agree with Owen, if one thinks more creatively about metrics, and perhaps that's an area in the development sector where we think you have to think much harder, these, a lot of these things are easy to measure. It's great to see somebody from Ipsos Mori here. I would love to see much more use of subjective data, opinion polls. This is data. This is not, and I take the point, the, the, the Facebook question about if you look at people's experience, are you promoting some people's experience over others? It doesn't have to be you know, a very small, unrepresentative number of people in a focus group, valuable though the information that you may get from that would be. It, you can do some of these things about experience and feelings and outcomes and different metrics can be done quantitatively, can be done methodologically with just as much rigor as any other quantitative data collection exercise. One can weight the results, one can disaggregate your, your sample so you know exactly who's answering what. One can look at it in terms of income group, in terms of gender, in terms of whatever else you want to put, whatever other kind of disaggregation you want to put on it. So I think... <coughs> If we want to do it, we do have a responsibility, and I think I agree with, I completely agree with Ruth, a moral responsibility to make sure that this is being done properly. And I think anything else, we may, start, as in all moral questions, sometimes you find yourselves falling short, and there may be good reasons for that, but that's what it is. It's not something which is okay, it's something that you should try to do better. Okay. I'm sort of inclined to say we should take another round. I have a million things to say. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do, we've got about um, seven or eight minutes left. Um, let's take one more round, so just try and keep it short, some quick points, and then I'll come back to the panel, and we can be thinking both about maybe a quick response, but also what your kind of final one minute sum up will be on this day. So let's hear from our live streaming audience first. This question is from Megan Lloyd Laney. We need to pay attention to evidence supply and appetite and capacity to use it, often missing and misunderstood. Timing is crucial and recognising policy windows is essential. Mugabe has just resigned. What opportunities for influencing the new regime in Zimbabwe? <laughs> <laughs> from ITAT. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the discussion around go effect. And um, for the, the past couple of years, I've been the results director on a fairly similar program that is supported in Nigeria, because we have empowerment. Um, but unlike go effect, we have quite a robust um, measurement system. And we had evidence, in fact, we, we had a good understanding of what was working and what wasn't. We were in discussion with David about an extension. Um, the project was always foreseen to be a 20-year vision of change. We'd had five years, there was going to be more. And uh, our friend Christian Tell said no, no more. So despite the evidence, there was a no. And we presented the evidence. Um, so I, I think evidence is, uh, on one project is not enough. And I think there are, reasons, there are other things going on. I think possibly your, your idea about a body of evidence, I think that's quite important. If we've been able to fall back on numerous other projects where there was a body of evidence around what works, we would have a lot more uh, support. But that then throws up the question, well, what does that mean for innovation? How do we move forward? How do we crack the problems that we haven't cracked now? Um, and, and what do we do in that space if, if actually the, the body of evidence that we have is the break to move it forward? How, how do we deal with that? The, the other factor I think it, that we clearly played out was about political survival of the Pretty Patel. 
and uh, her, her. <laughs> <laughs> Zalo, yeah, she felt vulnerable in the face of the right wing media's attacks on Girl Effect. Um, sadly, she didn't realise that private visits of Israeli officials made it that vulnerable. Um, but it was that political, her personal political survival, which was um, which undermined our case and the continuity of the program. And it has been really interesting the past few weeks. We've um, engaged with different staff, the, um, the upside down swan, those people who are serenely continuing to absorb this evidence about what works, recognising the really difficult political context that they're operating in, but still engaged, absorbing. And it just makes me think, you know, are, in terms of the timelines for us influencing policy and change, uh, do we just need to, if, we, if it's about building a body of evidence, if it's about seeing out certain you know, influential political figures and working with those you can work with, then the timelines for influencing policy are just much longer. Is, are we missing the trick in implementing immediate satisfaction? Yes, so I've just come from just a couple more. I think there was somebody just behind in the room up there. Hi there, my name is Richard Harrison. I'm from Axis, uh, based in Lebanon, working on the independent of Syria. The panel has great experience of working with politicians. How would you say politicians have changed over the years in terms of how they absorb and react to evidence? Okay, and I think one more. So, okay. Um, yes, yes. Uh, uh, my name is Luke, I'm the State of Children in the Education and Emergencies Department, um, and we're trying uh, quite desperately to get people to do more evidence based, well, anything, quite frankly, uh, <laughs> in the uh, Education and Emergencies. And one of the areas I wanted to ask the panel was about we have a huge proliferation of private actors, and in the Syrian crisis, was particularly, there's lots of money around there. So, how do we encourage? actors, private actors, to engage in evaluation because it often just doesn't happen, um, which is shocking. Uh, anyway, so uh, how do we encourage them to engage in this process, which is often very costly, it's often, you know, again, the bias issue that a lot of this doesn't work. So how do we encourage that in quite rapid response situations? Okay, great. Well, I think we're going to have to pass it there, so I'm going to come back to the panel. And Pick up on anything that you have heard here from this last round, but also give us your your your, your one minute, your final <coughs> thing. What would you like this audience to, to hear or remember from from this debate? Thank you, Melissa. I, I'd like to recommend uh, Paul Kearney's book, The Politics of Evidence-Based Policy, if you haven't read it, because um, he makes the argument that policymakers regularly use fast and frugal heuristics to make decisions. They just don't have the time to look at the evidence. They're, they're moving rapidly. And policy making is rarely linear, nor is it always logical. My own experience, I suspect Owen's, yours probably is some, some of this as well, is that policies are often made in the two weeks before a major speech by a minister. And what people are looking for are things that are eye-catching deliverables rather than solid work through. So it's all someone said, you've got to get the timing right. It's accumulating this evidence so when the moment opens up, it can grab that moment, and that applies to all kinds of political systems around the world. I think that, because um, there's so much rich commentary there to respond to, I think the one thing I wanted to pick up on is, what do we do, uh, it's kind of going back to Julian's point, uh, and the point we had from the online, but what do we do when people's experiences really matter? I think as a group of people, we can help communicate better by rec being emotionally literate, Mm -hmm. and trying to speak to people's experiences. For me, the greatest hero in this area was Hans Rosling. Mm -hmm. um, his ability to communicate basic truths in ways that were totally compelling mm -hmm. is something you know, we can all learn from. Mm -hmm. And it's being simple, concise, using pictures, and connecting with the heart as well as the head at the same time. Mm -hmm. Not compromising on the head, but connecting with the heart. Mm -hmm. And the question about how do we engage with people's experiences, I think that is key. Bearing in mind that people hold beliefs for lots of reasons. Um, sometimes that reason is because it's true. You know, a, a, a time that 
when the U.S. population, four out of ten people in the U.S. believed that Barack Obama was born outside the United States without any documentary evidence that that was the case. It was because it was convenient for them or socially acceptable for them. They had psychological payoffs for believing that, not because it was true. What, my one minute <coughs> thing, um, evaluate more. I, I'm genuinely in the camp with Owen that lots and lots of things can be evaluated. When I was in different, I was in the camp that we can't evaluate things in conflict situations. What a crock that was. I was so wrong. We can evaluate lots of things in conflict situations, and staff proved it to me. So evaluate more and using, so that's one thing. Second thing is use lots of methodologies. If you're someone who's only familiar with qualitative methods or only familiar with quantitative methods, well, shame on you. You <laughs> ought to be able to use multiple methods to get at different ways of seeing the problem. And that is responsibility for all of us. And my last thing is let's encourage each other and support each other to take on these big challenges and get the evidence heard. Great, Michael, thank you. So, Owen, any responses and final? Uh, another famous cliche about the, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and the second best time is today. And the evidence, you know, the sad story of an effective program in Nigeria that got cancelled in the, in the shadow of the Girl Effect program. Um, as you say, you know, it's, it's a question of the accumulation of evidence over time, both positive and negative, actually. There's, there's also a question about how much evidence do you need to cancel program, the famous debate in, within DFID about you know, how much more evidence do we need that microfinance programs do not let people out of poverty before we agree not to fund them anymore. And the answer is not yet, because it's politically convenient to get them funding microfinance programs, even though the evidence, despite the best efforts of programs, despite the best efforts of programs, the, um, you know, the, 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 so, um, we, we have to accumulate this evidence, and uh, as I said, you know, this is this is about shifting the, the probability distribution so that it's more likely that the right decision will get taken next time. But you can't assume that if you do a good evaluation, that your your project, however good it is, will get extended. But what what there is in government, uh, fam famously people said of Gordon Brown that his, in his gaze was like a, 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 a lighthouse that spun around and at the point it settled on you, you had to be ready to get up and dance, and then it would keep swinging, and then it would swing around again, and you would... And, um, that is a great image for a cabinet meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's true of many of us, that, that we, we, you know, while the light beam is not on us, we engage in research and evidence gathering of various kinds, and then we have to be ready to dance when the light beam falls on us, and um, at CGB we, we call this strategic opportunity, that we, in, we engage in gathering evidence, collecting ideas, and being ready with them so that when there is a, 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 a big international meeting and the government is suddenly desperate for an initiative on modern slavery, that we've got one on the shelf that is not only sensible but is evidence-backed and ready to go, and that we're trusted partners so they can phone us up and say, you don't have anything for us on modern slavery. And we say, yeah, we've got this ready to go, and it'll be, you know, here's the evidence. <coughs> so, what we have to do, and it depends on your role in this system, is is do the patient work, do the strategic work, and be ready to go with the opportunism when it comes. Um, uh, and that's partly the answer to Megan and, and you know what we do now with Mugabe. You think, you know, life comes at you quickly. And you have to spend a lot of time preparing for when it does come at you quickly and, and, and be ready with those good ideas. Lots of other things I want to react to, but time is not for no, I, so, I, think we're going to I have a slide in one of my talks that just ends in very large, like the shouty capitals. Everything is political all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of think that's what I'm left feeling here. You know, I think there's a question about what data is collected. There's a question, I think, from somebody about research funding that we haven't really answered. Yeah. And I think that speaks to, you know, ultimately the money which is spent on collecting data, you know, the funders, which, which programs they choose to evaluate and how, you know, all of these things are, polit are political. Modern government data systems started when governments wanted to know how many people exist, how many people they had to send into the army and how much property there was for them to tax. You know, data is always, investments in data have always followed politics and political needs and political demands. And I think that's no less true 
with the funding environment than it is with the actual government data system itself. So I think there's politics around what data is collected. There's politics, of course, as we've been saying about what data is used. One word that we haven't used yet, so I will, is, um, is waiting. You know, I think that we, not waiting as in waiting for a bus, but waiting <laughs> as in the weights which we attach to different pieces of evidence or evidence about different mm -hmm. types of people. You know, governments come into power, for example, with a program which is about, you know, providing the goodies, and this is, I'm not, this is not, I'm not using this pejoratively, this is as true in British electoral politics as anywhere else, and it's a good thing, it's how democracy works, providing the goodies for the people who voted for them. And so therefore they're going to weigh evidence about some groups more than others. Um, and I think so that you know, there is a sort of deeply political process about how evidence is used, which is the political process, which is not some add-on about sort of some individual decision or how we just how we react to the Daily Mail. It's absolutely at the heart of, of how politics works. So I think all of these things are political. I mean, I'll come back to what you said at the beginning. You know, if we want to be serious about the data which is collected, influencing policy, you have to start right <coughs> from the very beginning. Um, how is it produced? How is it used? Who's paying for it? And I think get much better at thinking through the politics of this to then start to influence the outcomes. Okay. Fantastic. Well, let's have a round of applause for our panel.